Why do we need to know the weight of the vacuum? Oh, there's no reason at all. Why do we need to know whether the Earth moves or doesn't? Well, I mean, we can wake up in the morning, brush our teeth and go to work, and who cares whether the Earth moves or not? I think being curious about how nature works, it's uh, uh, one of the greatest things we have done, and it's the way civilization actually developed. Often when we return from wonderful wild places like this, we say, oh, there was nothing there in hushed tones. But of course that's nonsense. There are things everywhere. And it turns out in scientific terms, there's no such thing as nothing. Even in the void between the stars, in the vacuum, there's a marvelous roil of particles and energy coming in and out of existence all the time. We're in Sardinia to meet a wonderful scientist and a wonderful experiment that's trying to measure the weight of that something between the stars. It's known as the Archimedes experiment and we'll soon continue our journey to find it in the wilds of Sardinia. But before we do that, we need to get some background from the theoretical lead of that experiment, Professor Carlo Ravelli. So quantum mechanics tell us that even if we put this in, 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 the, in the lowest energy possible, zero, then it's still moving a little bit. Okay, it's a little bit of energy there and it can be computed. So even when things don't move, there's energy. Second point, energy is the same thing as mass. That's a famous discovery of Einstein. E is mc squared. E is energy. Uh, M is mass. So energy works like mass. And mass has a weight. Okay, this mass weight. So this means that if this oscillates, or so there's more energy besides its own mass, it's also this energy, there's extra mass. So it's more weight. So far, so good. But now, there are uh, in, in the world around us, there is the electric field, the magnetic field, uh, the gravitational field, all these fields, and we know we are immersed inside these fields. They're all, all around here. And each one of them can oscillate. So all the fields are moving a little bit. Each one of them has its own little energy. So there's energy all over. So there's mass all over. So inside here, even there's nothing, there's mass. So it weight. There is the vacuum has its own weight. And the Chimides experiment is measuring the weight of the vacuum. That's the objective. But it's also designed to help solve a problem in theoretical physics, which is why gravity doesn't interact with the vacuum energy. But to do that, you first need to be able to measure that energy, or in other words, the weight of the vacuum. One can sit down and compute how much energy is here. And the computation is very simple. I can tell you here the computation in, in one line, okay? Uh, one of these, uh, one oscillator has a certain amount of energy, it's whatever it is, okay? It's finite, certain number. Now, how many oscillators there are in this box of empty space? Well, there's uh, this wavelength is one, there's this wavelength of one, so many, many uh, oscillators. Like every point has its own field oscillating. So there's an infinite amount of them. An infinite amount of oscillator, each one with a finite energy, it's an infinite energy. Which means that here there's an infinite mass. Oh, how can there be an infinite mass? If there was an infinite mass, it would be super heavy. Everything would be attracted gravitationally. So something got wrong here, okay? And that's what makes everything tricky and interesting. So tricky and interesting that if it was true, then the universe would be a tiny fraction of its current size. One estimate putting it at just 31 miles wide. Because all that mass would attract all the other mass. So this is an example of where experimental physics comes in to help out the theory. Professor Coloni, you're looking for the weight of the void between the stars. Why are we heading down into this old zinc and lead mine? 
because in order to measure the weight of the vacuum, we need a very, very quiet place. And this is one of the quietest places that we can find in Europe. When you say quiet, do you mean sound or geologically? Well, geologically mostly means the, the, the trembling of the earth and also we should be away from anthropogenic noise, it means uh, industries, farms, uh, or so Tra whatsoever, trains. traffic, trains, whatever can make the, the earth tremble, to, 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 to move and tremble. We're here. This is the first time I'm in this far underground. I thought I'd be a bit spooked, but I'm all right. Ora dimmi se dovevo uscire. What next, professore? Sorry? What's next? Ah, what's next? We, we, we walk for three, four hundred meters yes. until a, a, a bigger cavern that should, will host, I hope, the, exper the final experiment. Right, eh? okay. So we can, we can I go. see what we always have to wear at this stage in a razor film. And it fits. So we need uh, a lamp. Now onto the proposed site for the Archimedes experiment, deep underground. But first, a little bit of a historical detour. Ah, so now we, uh, do we see how, so now we are going to see the oldest part of the mine. Uh, so we are going up uh, for 15 meters, I think, you know, from, from here we did this. You're right, Benji. We, we, this is everybody's image of a, yeah. of of a mine. mine. Have a look, Benji. It was formerly a zinc and lead mine, but now it's decommissioned. But today, historical recreations make its history accessible for visitors. Director Lordo, how old is this part of the mine here? Diciamo che quasi 200 anni che la miniera è sfruttata industrialmente. And there are older parts of the mine that go back to Roman times. Yes, la parte 2000 anni fa gli schiavi da tutto l'impero romano, i primi cristiani venivano portati qua a lavorare a scavare il piombo e l'argento che serviva loro. So the journey continues. Yes. How much further have we got? So we will go uh, 400 meters more or less from, from, from where we are uh, to the next cavern, that is the cavern supposed to host the Archimedes experiment. And there seems to be a little doubt about whether the experiment will eventually end up down here. Yes, you are right, because uh, due to the fact that we don't have yet uh, the funding. The full <laughs> we, funding. The full funding. Yes. We, we, we cannot say that we will do it uh, here. I mean, uh, we are working to have this funding, for sure. Yes. And also our funding agency is well posed to start working. So I, I should be positive. Huh? I should be positive. You should be optimistic. Uh, yes, I should be optimistic. Nothing is gained by pessimism. But until the moment that we don't <laughs> see the money, I prefer to be conservative. But if you can't get the experiment down here, yeah. work, can you still do work on the surface? Allora, we, we can with more troubles, of course. Yes. Uh, the, the, the most important difference is it, it, that we would take data only during night. Right. Because again, we need a very quiet environment. So here, uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, even in surface. Yes. Uh, but or naturally only during nights. It is impossible to have the same quietness during the, the working day. I mean, there are cars, uh, people, which is uh, going in the Heavy mine. Heavy so on the tracks roads. So. Right. Okay. So. So, but if you can get it positioned down here, that means it can work 24 hours a day, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And that's important because this is all data, data, data. Yes, isn't it? when the experiment is, is ready and start to take in data, then the only things that we have to do is to take data and wait. Right. And uh, if we can do it in a 24 hours a day, it will be a, a, a huge benefit. I think we're here, are we here? Yes, this cavern is the cavern that has been excavated a few months ago. Mm -hmm. 
to Austria, the Archimedes well, experiment. Well, that recently, it's only been... That's true, with respect to 2,000 years yeah. of the mine, it's recently, very yes. recent. And, uh, of course, it is not enough, yeah? It is six meters tall, why we need 12 meters. And it is uh, also a bit small, and we need 10 meters by 10 meters on the surface. So, you know, so as it, an area, I mean. So six meters tall now, and it's going to be twice this height. Yes, yes. And yes. how much wider? And wider, you see, it's uh, eight uh, by ten now. So we need to have a square, but it is not much bigger than this. Yes. And so, will there be um, a building put inside? Yes, or? of course. It, right. will, it will become a real laboratory, so it will uh, be covered. Uh, to be safe mm. and uh, inside there will be a clean room uh, and whatever is needed to have a real lab. So everybody who's working a shift on the um, Archimedes experiment will have, this will be their commute every day to walk down here? Hopefully not every day of course because right. we, we will build an experiment which can be driven by from remote, so ah. by staying on surface. So we will access here, let's say once, uh, by for sure once a week, okay. for sure. And then also some more in the commissioning phase and so on. But what we, we will want to do, we want to realize it's something that you drive by remote, of course. It's self-managing. It's self-managing. And also it's, again, it is better to stay away from the, machine which is taking data, of course, mm. which is everything that you come, every moment that you come, you perturb the environment, and so you, you lose, lose data. So and so every time you come down, you need to log that I was down. And absolutely, I, yes. Right, absolutely, right. yes. Wow, because yes. it's that precise. Yes, uh, yeah, of course, of course. It's wonderful. Okay, we're heading above ground now. So done the easy bit, finding out where the experiment is going to live, now I just have to understand it, so that will be up to the professori. In fact, it will be up to both professoris. Professor Carlo Ravelli again. So now it's a brilliant idea of the Archimedic experiment. Take a cavity. Now change the distance of the two walls. So now I have a larger or a smaller, and now the amount of energy inside changes. That difference is measurable. And that's what the Archimedes um, experiment is gonna measure. So it's gonna measure the fact that the weight of this piece of space, if I narrow it, the weight changes. Which means that the box is gonna weight more or less depending of how large it is, just because of the little fluctuations of the field inside, the, the fuzziness of the field inside, and its quantum mechanical energy of these fluctuations, and the fact that energy is mass and weight. The Archimedes experiment is currently based in the workshop of an old granite quarry just down the road from the mine, as it waits to move underground. But right now, it's time for us to try and understand the experimental prototype which, because it uses lasers, means we need eye protectors. So, it's magnificent, but what, is, what am I seeing? Uh, so, this is a balance, and then a suspended... The, the big grey thing is the sample? Yes. yes right, this okay. One, this one. It's a lot more robust than I thought it would be. Okay, this is the... Oh, <laughs> goodness <laughs> me, it's so finely balanced. Uh, then, uh, this arm uh, is the one that can rotate and now we need uh, a, a, a way of detecting this rotation. Oh, okay? and I see. It, now, that's where the laser comes in. Yes. Now, an interferometer yeah. works uh, like that. You yeah. have a laser beam which yeah. is impinging there. Yeah. And then part of the light is pushed toward the first mirror that you see. Right. There. Part of the light is transmitted, reflected by this mirror, and sent to the other mirror that to you that see there. there. Then, if this arm rotates, uh, 
The path, for example, it rotates like that. The path of the beam that goes until the first mirror and comes back, eh, its path became longer. Yes. While the other one, eh, which comes from here, from the other mirror, be becomes shorter. Right. Eh? When the two beams recombine again at the photodiode, eh, their interference changes because one path has become longer and the other one has become shorter. Goodness and me. you take and this changes the amount of light that impinges on the photodiode and this is our signal. That's how you measure how much it's moved, by yes. the interference. Goodness so me. it is this this machine is capable to read much much less than one micron. And this is why it's so, it's, so, it's so sensitive. This is the principle of the interferometer. So it means all the machines that use an interferometer are, are so sensitive. This rather robust thing is so finely balanced that you can ah, yes. move it by breathing on it. Yes, of course. Makes me now understand even yes, better of course, of course. why you need to be in this very, very geologically stable, still place. Yes, of course. Yeah. Now I really understand it. It's amazing. Yes. And how, I just can't get in my head how people are able to build stuff this precise. I, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to people like you, I always worry about the planet being overpopulated, right? Mm -hmm. But then I talk to people like you and I think, actually, we need this many people to have enough people as smart as you <laughs> to be able to make things like that. I don't. <laughs> I don't. No? <laughs> I, don't, I don't really don't know. So we've seen the prototype to measure the change in weight. Now it's time to meet the real thing, to find out how to make the weight change. Oh, so this is the beast. So this is our big experiment. It's the machine that we want to use to measure the weight of the vacuum. Why is this so big and industrial if it's going to measure something as ephemeral as the weight of the vacuum? Because the, the balance that we will use that this is inside is not so small. Eh? Mm. It's something which is of the order of one meter, one meter and a half. The arm is very big. And he must, it must work under, under, um, at low temperature. Ah. Eh? So it's a big chamber at low temperature. So what you actually see is uh, the first shell of a cryostat. Uh, cryostat being something that's really cold. Yes, that will be filled with uh, liquid nitrogen uh, in order to stay at uh, low temperatures, 77 Kelvin. And uh, we need it uh, in order to reduce also the so-called thermal noise and the other points why it is relatively big is because our sample is not just a, a small thick of vacuum but it is a sample which is bigger like that mm -hmm. and uh, it is made of a lot of uh, small slides uh, that um, at the end have a, a thickness of some something like a centimeter this is hendrik casimir before we go on, we need to understand an idea he first posited in 1948. It's now named after him, and it's called the Casimir effect. You take these two slides, for example, two, two slides which are completely reflective. Okay, what are they imagine made of? To what, have, are, what are they made of, those slides? No, now they are imaginary. Okay? Oh, okay. They They're are still the imaginary. best that you can do in the world. Right. Or it's, uh, they are almost mathematics, let's say. Okay. Yeah? Right. So you, we imagine that they can reflect whatever wavelength that we want. Right. Okay? They are perfectly reflective. Then, suppose again that these two slides are far away, one yes. from the other one. And then, again, as I said before, all the vacuum wavelengths are allowed to, to, do, to live inside this volume. Yep. Then now, suppose to get uh, shorter and shorter uh, distance among them, as, as you bring the, them nearer and nearer, eh, as I said before, the longer wavelengths are, are not anymore allowed mm. to survive. Before we go on, we need to understand one more thing, virtual photons. 
When I was trying to research this and trying to get my head around it, the, the virtual particles kept coming up. Yeah. Are they part of that vacuum Absolutely. energy? How does that work? Uh, now think about the fields. So for instance, there's electric field, magnetic field, and we know that the oscillations of the electric and magnetic field, the waves, is light. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. But quantum mechanics, these are particles. So it's little jumps. So light is, uh, is discrete, it's packets, it's photons. That's what a photon mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. When there's no light, no photons, still there is some minuscule fluctuations, which is like a photon being created and destroyed immediately, being created and destroyed immediately. So we can think of the vacuum as all this fluctuation, all this little appearing and disappearing of particles, which are the virtual photons. Uh, and uh, so we are measuring the weight of the virtual particles, how it changes by changing the shape of the, of the box. So when we say virtual, it doesn't mean not real. These, these are real, they're just incredibly short-lived. Yeah, that's one way of viewing it. So what we have, we had at the end, that there are virtual photons here, virtual photons on the other side, and then in this volume, a bit less of virtual photons with respect to outside. Okay. Now, due to the fact that the virtual photon exert the pressure, uh, when there is inside a, a number of virtual photons less with respect to outside, it, they, the virtual photons inside are not anymore uh, strong enough to, to Resist. Contract with respect to this the other. And so, the, the, so the virtual photons from outside yeah. are pushing the two plates together. Yes, perfectly. And, and, and you can measure that. Yes, this force is called the Casimir force. It has been measured, verified. Now it is verified at the level of 1 over 1,000. I mean, it's, it's absolutely clear. While it's based on the work of Casimir, the Archimedes experiment uses a slightly different approach. So our sample is a, a, a stack uh, of Casimir cavities, of mm -hmm. uh, cavities that uh, have uh, the, the possibility uh, to expel a bit of vacuum from their space. Right. Uh, and then uh, uh, when we do like that, uh, when we, if we succeed in pushing away this vacuum from them, then if the vacuum actually do wait, uh, then this sample should have a force toward the height and the balance should turn. Ah, oh, so it's not two plates coming together, it's one plate on a balance. It's an enormous series of plates, mm -hmm. uh, which are near, very near one to the other one, in yes. order to have a lot of this effect. Right. It is a rigid cavities, something mm -hmm. like that, in which, with something which is, let's say, a trick, you change the reflectivity of the cavity. So that uh, when uh, imagine the, the, the cavity is transparent, uh, all the vacuum can penetrate in the cavity. When you make the two slides reflective, the vacuum, which is too longer to enter inside, is expelled from there. So it, it, it's resting on a balance. And if you're successful in expelling the vacuum, it will be lifted up. Absolutely, yes. The trick is that we have to find a way to change this reflectivity, um, these um, slides, uh, to, to, have it, to change their reflectivity with, passing, with having them passing from normal to superconductor. Ah. Try slowing down the temperature, step by step, very small, smoothly. In the real experiment, uh, between the two slides, there is a, a small dielectric um, slide. Dielectric? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Which, which means? It, which means that they, it, it has not, uh, uh, it is not conductive. It's not uh -huh. conductive at all. So in this, in this sense, the vacuum can penetrate without having been disturbed from it. Another way to say it is porous to the vacuum? Is it, is that, is, yes, 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 We've given a simplified view here based on the prototype, but the real sample is a specially grown crystal that looks like this. Under very cold temperatures, the layers inside the crystal, 
separated by the dielectric compound, become more reflective, eventually excluding the different wavelengths of vacuum energy, which, remember, can also be regarded as mass. So, by excluding this mass, the weight of the sample decreases. I'm quite astounded because I think I understand it now. <laughs> <laughs> I hate asking this question as a science journalist, but why do we need to know the weight of the vacuum? Why do we need to know the weight of the vacuum? Oh, there's no reason at all. Why do we need to know whether the Earth moves or doesn't? Well, I mean, we can wake up in the morning, <laughs> brush our teeth and go to work, and who cares whether the weight, the Earth moves or not? Um, why do we have to be intelligent? We can be stupid, right? There's no, <laughs> no request of that. So, um, I think being curious about how nature works, it's uh, uh, one of the greatest things we have done, and it's the way civilization actually developed. As a little boy, what made you, what, what happened that made you dedicate your life to something like this? I, because I thought that physics was very beautiful, <laughs> also when I was very young. And the idea of uh, pushing your imagination toward understanding the world, I think it was a very, very beautiful thing to do. So you saw the beauty? Ah, yes, 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 you, yes, yes, yes. The beauty, the mystery and the fa fascinating things to have something that maybe even humanity doesn't know yet. And also to give a contribution to understand what happens, how we are, how the world is done. This is fascinating for, for a young boy, I think. And, and not only, of course. And you're still that young boy, still My Yes, that, don't say no. Yeah, say yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are many other things in which I'm not anymore. I'm, I am not anymore a young boy. But at least here, yes. Yes, yes, yes.